from the J.C. Newman Cigar Studios in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Smokin' Tobacco Show with your hosts, Matt Tobacco and Smokin' Nicole. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Smokin' Tobacco Show. My name is Matt Tobacco from SmokinTobacco.com, and I am joined once again by my beautiful fiance, Smokin' Nicole. And tonight we have a very special guest. Not that all of our guests aren't special, um, but we have a very unique guest, someone who doesn't do a lot of shows, from what I understand. So this is definitely interesting, but you all know who he is, or at least you've read his articles and reviews. It is the one and only Charlie Minato of HalfWheel.com. Charlie, how are you? I am doing well. How are the two of you doing? Yeah, we're doing good. You know, it's another Thursday night, having a cigar. Just getting out of work. Sorry to the extent, but had a busy day, and this is my cigar, my unwind time. Yeah, that's all it is. But, you know, sorry, my cigar went out and it's going to drive me nuts. Um, but, no, we're really excited to have you on because you know, anytime we do these kind of media mashups, so to speak, um, you know, it's always fun and interesting. The ones we've done so far um, a lot similar to kind of our own avenue of what we do. Uh, but Half Wheel is a little different. You know, Half Wheel, um, much bigger, especially in the online presence when it comes to online cigar media. Um, you guys do kind of things your own way, a different way. Um, there's some things that you guys are known for, like the consensus that we'll get into. So um, definitely, I, definitely I, I think it's going to be a, a little bit different for the media mashup kind of episode. Um, you know, one of the, first of all, I'll ask you, what are you smoking before we get too, too, too deep into it? Um, let me see if I can do the old Stogie review trick. I am smoking a San Cristobal de la Habana 20 Anniversario. Ah, and it is not plugged, but it is quite tight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the luck of the draw with those, you know? <laughs> I mean, I it's feel like... It's an expensive like, roulette game. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the last... I have... I think we have, like... I want to say we've had three boxes of cubans in the last year within you know in the house and i think i've only had one so far that was like this sucks the rest of them were like enjoyable enough um to get through i was a little surprised and, and i've had a good amount of them too um but yeah it, it, you never know what you're going to get with those uh nicole what are you smoking um so i am smoking a padron 1926 Maduro. And that is the number 35 Amazing. Padron 1926. It's a small little cigar. It's a great cigar. You can pick this cigar up at twoguyscigars.com for 13.60 per cigar or you can buy a box for 325.99. Um, I myself am smoking the Diamond Crown Julius Caesar Toro. Uh, fantastic cigar rolled by the Fuente family for JC Newman. Uh, this cigar is also available at twoguyscigars.com for fifteen thirty nine per cigar or a box of twenty for two seventy three ninety nine. And that is at the number two guys cigars dot com. Um Charlie, you know, I'll get right into it. Before we kinda get into kind of what you guys do now and what you've been working on and stuff like that, um, just as a brief, not too in depth, just how exactly uh, did you get in how did how did Half Wheel start? I know that you did something before that. Just kind of the quick rundown of the history of kind of how you've, you've gotten to where you are now. Yeah, I started smoking cigars um, in college, and uh, I was curious about not just the, the sort of end tobacco product, but uh, as I started to learn beyond the, the sort of non-Cuban Cuban brands, the, you know, the Altadas in general, uh, Romeo and Julieta and Red Dot Cohibas, um, and started to learn about brands like Oliva, and Camacho, uh, I was very curious to see how sort of intermingled the cigar business was. Uh, you had people like Placencia making cigars for five or six different companies, which isn't, you know, that unheard of. Uh, major corporations uh, use contractors to make all sorts of stuff, uh, and some of those contractors make stuff for their competitors. But obviously, in a in a business where it's a whole bunch of families, uh, it, you know, not publicly traded companies um in a condensed space it, it was very interesting to me and also that the timing was i think a, a a unique time in the cigar industry i suppose every period of time is unique but 
uh, at that time, limited edition cigars and, and single store releases were really picking up um, in sort of the 2008 to 2010, 2011 range. Um, and uh, there was a lot of cigar blogs. They mainly just reviewed cigars. And if General or Drew State sent a press release out, they would republish the press release. And, and that was basically the extent of the news, uh, other than what Cigar Aficionado would put out. And a lot of what CA was covering was in Cigar Insider, which is a, you know, an, a subscription publication that is and particularly at the time was not something that I think most people that smoke cigars had any idea existed. Um, and so there was just a lot of cigars being released that weren't being written about. And it seemed like there was, uh, you know, I certainly was interested in knowing like what the new products were. And, and um, I figured there were probably some other people that were as well. So that website was called the cigar feed and um, I ran it for, I guess, two years. Um, and during that time um, I met Brooks who ran smoking stogie, uh, which was his own site, which, Reviewed cigars, but was a lot different than most cigar blogs. Um, he reviewed rare and hard to find cigars. And I, Brooks's site was one of the few that I really enjoyed reading as a consumer of, of information because he was smoking uh, a lot of cigars I'd never heard of that were super interesting. Um, you know, something like the little Florida Dominicana El Museo. It's not a cigar that, you know, gets talked about even 10 years ago on a regular basis. And, and to see somebody sort of lighting up just one Holy Grail cigar after another Holy Grail cigar after another. And uh, Brooks's background in photography meant that the pictures were just a lot better to look at than uh, than what you would typically see on the internet. So I bet Brooks, he was in Dallas, um, which is where my parents lived and where I grew up, uh, at least for a decent part of my life. And uh, when I came back from school uh, one winter break, we met up and we started talking and you know hit it off because we were doing a lot of the same work. Brooks was trying to find information out about where the next limited edition Taiwahe or Viaje was going to ship to um, so that he could review it. And I was trying to find that information out so I could write a new story about it and, and maybe review it. And um, Brooks suggested that I come work for him. Uh, I vetoed that. And uh, a few months later, Brooks went to the trade show for the first time. And, and one of those nights, um, after sort of taking him around the trade show and introducing him to a whole bunch of people he had met on the internet but had never met in person, um, we sat down and we talked and I said, you know, I, I think that there's a way we can work together, but I think we're better off uh, taking um, the parts and creating a new sum. And so we quickly uh, started working that summer, uh, that August on Half Wheel. And it launched on January 1st, 2012. Um, we took all the content from both of the blogs or, or most of the content and converted it over to Half Wheel. And uh, we also... Um, before we launched, we were talking to Patrick um, about bringing him on board. Patrick was someone who wrote for Cigar Snob and Examiner.com at the time. And he was one of the few people that every once in a while would actually write sort of an independent news article. He'd find out about something and he'd, he'd put it on Examiner. Or, um, and so for me, I figured it would be helpful to have some other people that could write news stories beyond just myself. And uh, we had no idea. Uh, I don't think Patrick had any idea what half would become, and I, I certainly had no idea what half would become or how useful Patrick would be um, and, and how big of a part of half wheel um, he's been. And uh, we also had a Brian Burt who reviewed cigars for us, still works uh, the trade show and some other things for us. Um, but that's basically been the team more or less since uh, since day one. And, um, you know, at the time we just wanted to create a cigar blog that sort of embodied what we would want to read. The reviews similar to Smoking Stokey, maybe a little bit widespread. Um, the news from Half Wheel, and then another big focus of ours was daily publishing, because it's hard to imagine, but at the time, uh, most cigar blogs, uh, and there were a lot more of them, there was Stogie Review and Stogie Guys, but with the exception of Stogie Guys, very few of them were publishing more than three or four times a week, and we felt like if a cigar blog was going to sort of elevate itself, it was important to obviously have the quality of content and, and to have some unique content, but also to be like the websites that you know people read on a daily basis, which means they need to be updated daily and they need to be happening sort of in the moment, not reporting about trade shows three months after they happen. And we just tried to sort of fix all those little things that we could find with the work that we were previously doing and, and we called it Half Wheel. Yeah, you know, and you guys have done a really great job. I mean, most people in the industry, if, if not everybody in the industry, you know, I feel like Half Wheel's the first destination for a lot of people um, with a lot of things, and uh, but it's also not even just about news. It's it's the reviews you guys do. I mean, some of the reviews you guys have done, um, you know, have been 
you know, really popular or highly regarded or whatever. Um, we don't do reviews of smoking tobacco. Uh, it's something that, you know, we have talked about doing in the future. We're just, it's not, it's, it's not something I, I want to get into at this point in time. Um, but can't you know, commit. <laughs> yeah, I can't really commit at this point in time. Just it's it's a time and I would recommend not doing them. Yeah, I see. And and and, and Coop, you know, he he talked me out of it too. You know, I was like, I don't know, and he's like, no. He's like, don't it, unless you don't, you know, it, it'll ruin it for you. I'm like, yeah, it just I know how involved it is, and um, you know, with with my time the way it is right now, it's not something I I want to get into and then ruin whatever time I do have with cigars. Um, but you know, but I do respect those who do. And you guys do do a great job. Um, I know you review, Patrick reviews, and Brooks reviews, um, you know, and pretty frequently too. Um, you've talked about reviewing recently, um, and then of course, you know, you you guys also unveiled your your top twenty five as all of us did. But the other thing that's interesting about all of that is you do something different that most people know of, but um it has really nothing to do with you it's the consensus um and it's something i know you've been talking about and i know it's something that you've talked about how you don't know if it'll continue it's been more of a burden for you the last few years than it's been any kind of joy um but what i will ask you first is how did the consensus come to be um i you know, the interesting thing with the consensus is uh, I was not the first one to do it. Uh, Brian Hewitt did a version of it uh, that I don't actually uh, certainly when I was when I thought of the name, the consensus and the, the sort of project, I had forgotten about Brian Hewitt's uh, attempt at it. Um, but the way it started was every year when, you know, people were doing their top lists. And once again, this is a very different. This is 11 years ago. It's a very different time in, in how cigar media was. Um, CA would put out their list and everyone else would put out their respective lists and people would complain about CA's list about the, the kind of cigars that were on it. Why wasn't this one on it? Why is this cigar that this ranked? And, you know, CA's list is the only one that really carries much cachet, um, even to this day. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think very many people are buying cigars based off of the number three cigar of the year off of Half Wheels list or anyone else's list. I mean, I'm sure there's some, but, but for the most part, Probably. CA is the only one that really kind of moves the needle. And um, I was curious to know if all of the criticisms, not all of them, but if a lot of the criticisms to CA's list were valid from a statistical standpoint, specifically, you know, the complaints about CA's list being out of touch and about why is this cigar that's been on the market for 15 years on this list. And also to figure out if the bloggers um, in particular at that time, because podcasting existed, but not in the anywhere close to what it currently is. Um, and there were, were more blogs, at least from my recollection, than there are right now. Um, and, and to see if, if there was any commonality between the blogs, see if there's any commonality between the magazines, see if there was any commonality between everyone. And, um, you know, in the first few years, it, it was a very interesting thing for me. The results were not as predictable as they've sort of become. And, uh, you know, it, it's also, it's an immense amount of work. It was an immense amount of work from the, the start. The first year was easy, though, because we didn't have a top 25 because we had basically no reviews uh, from Half Wheel, at least, uh, right. you know, when we started. So the first year was easy. Uh, but after that, obviously, having both our list and and then the consensus and now the live shows that go along with it and the rest of it, it, it certainly is uh, not my favorite 10 day stretch of the year um, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. I And listen, you were on with Developing Palettes and Coop. Uh, last week, I believe that was. I think it was last. Was it last Monday or this Monday? Yes. Um, last and, Monday. And I caught I caught a bit of that show, and I, and I know that you talked about it there too, um, as well as I I watched when you were on doing the consensus, um, and you had and both times you had mentioned like, yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna keep doing the consensus because it's just getting more and more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's not so much the work is more difficult; it's that the results are extremely predictable, at least up top. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, from a statistical analysis standpoint, analysis standpoint, it, it's now like, okay, we've got a model that's pretty reliable, um, even if the model is pretty, you know, is not necessarily numerically based. It's you know, 
the likely answer is the top cigar will be from either Drew Estate, Hoya de Nicaragua, Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust, or Foundation. Um, and some combination of those four companies is going to do very well about the number of cigars they place in the top five. And I, I just wonder how useful it is if if that's going to be the case. And I think with the exception of maybe two years, that, that's been the case for the 11 consensus that have been published. Now, I noticed that you made a comment on the Developing Palette show that um, – how did you say it? You had said that you had told people or people had approached you in the past about the consensus and like how, how like, you know, how, um, how do you get it? Like, how do you get onto the consensus or whatever? But, or you had told people that you would tell them something along those lines. And then only one person has actually asked you about the consensus and like what they need to do to get on the consensus. But that no one else seems to take you up on that offer. Why do you think that is? Um, I mean, I, I think people care about the top 25 list when they're being published and when they're not seeing their name or when they're seeing their name and they think it should be higher. And then they go back to doing their actual jobs, which, you know, to my point earlier, I, I don't think with the exception of CA's list that it really moves the needle much. Um, you know, I don't mean any disrespect to whatever the 15th cigar of the year was on Half Wheel's list. It's something you can put sort of, you know, in an ad or on your website, but I suspect that we didn't have much of an impact for the number 15 cigar of the year. And knowing Half Wheel, there's like a chance that, that cigar was, there was 300 of them it sold out and whatever. But um, I think that's the case with all of them. I mean, I, I don't think that the number 15 cigar on Cigar Journal's list or on your list or Coop's list or whoever it is, or quite frankly, even CA's list really makes much of a difference. I mean, I think it, at this point, you know, I, I hear stories and I'm sure you guys have heard some that, Back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, people would walk in, they'd print the CA list out or they'd walk in with the magazine and they'd be like, give me one of everything or give me as many as you got yeah. from the full 25. And now it, it's very clear the hoopla is basically reserved for the number one cigar of the year. And, um, you know, I, I think that that is a natural uh, progression just because of the amount of media, not just cigar media, but just the amount of things people can consume on a daily basis, the amount of information um, from any number of sources, it just means that we're less focused, we're less likely to sit down and spend 15 or 20 minutes going through the whole list. It's like, okay, let me scroll through this, get angry, leave some nasty comments and call today. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I think for the manufacturers, it's a similar story. It's like, man, I, I wish that we were higher, I wish we were on this list, and then, you know, next week it's back to actually selling cigars. Now. One thing that came up this year, and, I, and I've talked about it with Coop and a couple of the other media you know, people that are around, but I, w I was actually interested to get your take on this firsthand. Um, in, in this year's lists, and, and it's not the first time you know, either and, and whatnot, but it was a topic that did come up this year. A lot, there was a, well, maybe not a lot, but there was at least a handful of cigars that made lists that were otherwise either not available yet or extremely limited release. Um, for example, Paladin de Saka making lists um, when it shipped, I want to say mid December and got to retailers, you know, weeks, if not a week before the end of the year. Um, I, there was a little bit of, I don't want to say, yeah, I'll say pushback on that, just given its timing, like, oh, Right at the end of the year, this cigar gets snuck into a list. Plus, you know, Sokka did send them out as samples to a lot of people, too, around that same time. Do you feel that what, – what is well, what is your feeling on that? Do you think that a cigar should really be out much longer for it to be eligible for any list? Um, or anything uh, along, I don't. <laughs> along those lines? <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't really care. I mean, I, I find it to be interesting. It's an interesting data point, but – uh, I certainly, I, I think at least, I seem to care a lot less about the consensus than most of the people that were on that developing palette show. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure why, but uh, I don't really care. Like, I don't, if you guys were like, hey, we're going to put together a top 25 list, but we're only going to, the only cigars that are going to be eligible are cigars that have red in the band somewhere. That's fine. As far as I'm concerned, as long as you make it clear <laughs> what your process is, you know, uh, do whatever you want. Like, a, 
we have a list that has a it half wheel that has a different set of procedures than Coop's list, for example, and probably a different set of procedures about what's eligible. I mean, certainly a different set of procedures about what's eligible for the CA list. So, uh, yeah, as long as the as long as people are being honest and are, you know, my big thing is being upfront about how these lists are created. Go for it. Um, you know, if you look, if you got a box of Paladin de Saka, whether you paid for it or not, and you smoked it and you thought it was one of the best cigars of the year, if you're doing a list that you say these are the best cigars I've smoked or reviewed this year, it should be on it, right? I mean, right. we took some flack for putting the My Father Humidor Deluxe or have, ranking it as our top cigar of the year. It was a very expensive cigar that was very difficult to find um, because there weren't that many of them. They were only sold in a humidor. Retailers weren't supposed to break them up, which meant that in order to buy them, you had to spend thousands, you know, $10,000, something like that, to get them. Obviously, very few people have smoked that cigar in comparison to most cigars that have, you know, been named number one cigar of the year by other people. Right. But how dumb would it be if we sat around on a live show and we're like, Okay, the number two or the number one cigar of the year is the Opus X Forbidden X 13 Deseos de Amor, which was our number two cigar. That's the number one cigar of the year. But it probably wasn't the best cigar that we smoked that came out in 2021. There was this My Father Humidor Deluxe that, that came out, but it was super limited. So we didn't put it as our number one cigar of the year, even though we think it's probably better. I mean, that seems like a real terrible thing as a consumer. It's like, okay, what else did you smoke this year that you thought was great, but too limited or too expensive to make the list? And Half Wheels in no position to be criticizing people for stuff like that. You know, when we started the website, a very large focus of it was to review pre-release cigars that did not stop until, I don't know, four or five years ago. And we kind of shifted away from it and expanded our focus. We've also had number one cigar of the years be a few years ago. It was a Hoy de Nicaragua, the numero uno. That was an event only cigar at that point. You couldn't even buy it. We've had cigars, uh, a Quesada Reserva Provada Barber Pole that was a store exclusive Barber Pole cigar. We've had all sorts of weird shit that Davidoff Oro Blanco, like our number ones are about as off the wall as anybody, um, right. certainly from a how easy it is to get the cigar. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and try to chastise people for, oh, it wasn't on shelves long enough or it was too expensive or too limited. Do whatever you want. Just try to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a really good point. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring that up with you is because, you know, it, it does get talked about and um, – it's interesting to hear you say that and, and talk about how, to your point, like, oh, well, it, just because, it, you know, it, it was super limited, you know, it doesn't mean we can't include it. If we thought it was really that good, it should be on the list. Um, but, you know, it, it but I bring it up because, you know, it is a subject that gets talked about in, in the media circle, as I'm, as I'm sure you, you know, obviously aware. Um, and so it, it's just it, it was nice to get your opinion on that. And, and I could see that that makes sense. Um, there's this definitely validity to that too. I mean, there's there's no reason to leave something off the list. But I agree. As long as you have a criteria posted, I think that is the biggest part to any list, regardless of what's on it. As long as there's a criteria of how that list came to be and why those cigars are there. And I, consumers need to take that with a grain of salt because again, it's varied on who's putting together that list and what they want to include, and it's entirely up to them. Mm. At the end of the day, I mean. You know, uh, people who are arguing that someone should have rated something higher, it's their list. They can do what they want. You don't have to read it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. At the end of the day, you don't even have to Same read the list. Same with ours. You don't have to read ours. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I'm just – I was a little distracted for the last few minutes. This cigar just won't – it just won't stay lit and burn right. Um, Ooh. Like, it's going out very quickly. It's 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 slightly tight. It's not what I normally expect from a Julius Caesar. Um, I'm hoping I can still salvage through this, but this is uh, this is burning pretty poorly, and I'm surprised because usually they don't have these issues with Diamond Crown. Um, there was a few questions in the chat. I'm gonna go back here a little bit because I I let some go by. Yep. Um, from Tom Criswell Jr. Here, I'll throw that up on screen for people. Uh, what are your thoughts? This is for you, Charlie. What are your thoughts with regard to blind cigar ratings? Do you think they, do you think your annual list would see similar results if they were blind? Does anyone publish annual quote best of end quote list with a blind process? Um, I can answer that. I know 
I believe Cigar Journal definitely does it all blind. If I'm not mistaken, I, I'm almost positive their stuff's all done blind. I, I think you would know that, Charlie. I believe that that is how they describe it, yes. Yeah, and I, th I think there's a few others, especially in the written portion. I think that's how they do it. But yeah, I'll, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I, I to, to answer the would it be different, Probably. Um, I, I think any tweak that we made to the process would probably produce different results, um, particularly because we have a panel of people. We have four people. Um, and so it, it, it's not, it, it, it's, you know, there are more variables at stake. Um, and so when you start adding variables to the equation, it, it certainly makes the process um, a bit less consistent. Um, in terms of the pros and cons of, of blind reviews, um, the reason why we do not do them is because logistically it would be challenging for us. Um, we try to review new cigars, and so having blind reviews would require us to have another person who was responsible for getting the cigars, taking the bands off, sending them out to people. Um, we'd also probably need to, at that point, either remove Brooks from the uh, the review panel or the reviewers um, or hire an additional photographer because one of the big issues we have is that our staff I mean this is the the three people that review cigars for us at this point full-time this is what they do for a living um, and so they're aware of what's happening in the cigar business and so if they see a cigar that comes out um, I don't know the League of Nevada year the tiger right there are some of these cigars that that are a bit unique looking and uh, you know, it's not to say there's not another cigar in the world that doesn't look similar to it, but... Um, Do you mean the they're, Davidoff they're... Year of the Tiger? No, no, I'm saying, like, the League of Karate Year of the Tiger, I don't know what that one looks like. There's certainly the Davidoff Year of the Tiger, the... I just reviewed the Room 101 Nabakubi, uh, right. which is a pretty unique perfecto shape. The uh, Punch Rare Corojo that General announced this week, that's another unique shape. Right. The one I always go back to because it was a CA Top 25 oh. winner was the Andalusian Bowl. There's oh, no yeah. way, in my opinion, that anyone on our staff could attempt to review an Andalusian bull and not know what it is. There's nothing else in the market that I'm aware of that looks like it. You know, we're kind of aware of what La Florida Minicana's tobacco tastes like on a daily basis. It, it's pretty obvious what it is. And right. so then it becomes a question of can you review those cigars blind and still say you're doing blind reviews if the reviewer is 99.9% .9 sure of what they're smoking? And at that point, uh, I sort of look at it as the well's poisoned and it, it's not fair to either the Andalusian Bowl or to the other cigars you're reviewing because you know more or less what one of them is, but the other ones you're a bit confused by. Um, I also think that there are some parts of blind reviewing that don't get talked about that are there are some cons. Um, I think a lot of times when people are smoking stuff blind or tasting stuff blind, they're constantly more focused on, even if they, they aren't actively trying to do this, but it's sort of subconsciously focused on trying to figure out what it is as opposed to paying attention to what's happening. Some people I'm sure can flip the switch and, and just completely ignore that. But I certainly, when I'm doing blind tasting exercises, find myself trying to guess what what's going on. What's the tobacco? What's this tobacco? What factory does this look like the cigars come from? Um, and so uh, for us, I think it's just not the right way to go about it. Um, the other thing that we do that's a bit different is we smoke three cigars per review. We the same person smoke three cigars back to back to back. Um, and that gives us the ability to say, hey, look, two of these were great. One of them, you know, is like the cigar Matthew smoking, just for whatever reason, it's not burning today. And that's an important thing. There's a difference between three cigars that, that smoke the same and three cigars where two of them smoke the same and one of them doesn't. And so I think the blind reviews work well when there's a tasting panel and when it's like you're going to smoke one cigar and then go on to the next one and on to the next one. Um, for us, the way that we've set it up, I, I think it would just be a, a bit challenging. But I certainly I have no doubt that it would change our results and also that there are benefits to it. it you know, there's no question that the more information you know, the more preconceived judgments you're going to have about it, despite whatever we try to do to check those at the door. Yeah, I feel like blind, ta blind, um, blind tasting cigars and blind reviewing, um, I feel like it sounds good on paper. You know, like, oh, well, if you did it blind. But it's a logistical nightmare. Yeah. Once once you <laughs> once you put it, put all that down and you look at it, um, you can see why it is not more. I don't want to say more popular, but not not a practice that's more commonly used um, because 
first of all, yeah, it's a logistical nightmare, first of all. Number two, I, I think there's a lot of sense to that because every time that I've ever had a cigar blind when someone's tried to test me or just be like, hey, just try this and what is it? No, just just smoke it and let tell me what you think. You're right. Your mind and it's and it's hard and like you said, some people can probably turn it on and off, but it's also hard for the mind to like take a cigar, you don't know what it is, and just smoke it and just see how it is by itself and not have your mind being like, Well, what is this? What tobacco does this taste like? What factory does this does this remind me of? Looking at it, tasting it, how does it smoke? you get distracted from the element of just trying to focus on it by itself with no other external variables like you mentioned um which you know in the long run that could that could take away from the the final result of that review or you know whatever if you were trying to go in depth with it um so i i, I think it makes sense too like i said i don't even do reviews um but i know the blind taste one is that's a question that doesn't get asked a lot at least in fr to, to my knowledge but this might be a stupid question, and not to you, Charlie, but to the audience who are chiming in right now in our comments. Why do you care so much about these lists? Because you all have very strong opinions. I'm just genuinely curious of why you care so much about the media list. It's a great Throw question. It and honestly, this is this is really your time to... to this is your time to shine. Uh, other than I would say someone from CA, I yeah. mean, Charlie is probably one of the best people that you could really bring this to um we have 26 <laughs> people watching tell me why do you care about these lists yeah it's true <laughs> i mean it, i mean other than i think you know what i think i think people just get wrapped up in the hype of like huh what's number one gonna be what's charlie gonna give number one what's ca gonna give no well I've, everyone's always preparing for ca's number one like it's super bowl sunday like because they post the date all right it's on thursday you know january 12th you know, the, the final three, and everyone knows, and they prepare for it, like, okay, today's the day. CA's number one's coming out. Um, which, you know, to Charlie's point earlier, yeah, CA is always kind of the one that everyone cares about. But still, regardless, there there is a large population of people who are, like, wondering what Half Wheel's going to do. What's Coop going to do? What's, you know, what, you know, we did our first one this year, so probably not as much. But, you know, the people like Charlie and Coop who have been around for a while, um, who do this every year yeah this i think it's the hype it's just what's it going to be who who's going to get it and who's not and i think people have this preconceived notion of like this is what the cigar of the year is going to be because i smoked it and it was fantastic there's no way and then you know half wheel will put it out uh, which by the way you guys do a great job with it you do it live you do it all on video you have them all up there you guys all do it together um but and then I feel like just people are just waiting for that. And then it comes out and you have people who are either like, oh, my God, that's awesome. Or I feel like the majority of the time it's, oh, really? And it's like that side eye. Like they gave that number one. Uh, like you mentioned, you guys got flack because of the My Father cigar that you guys gave Cigar of the Year. Uh, being what it was, people kind of complained about it. And it's like, well, you wanted to know what number one was. They took the time to put the list together. And that's what it is. So... I mean, and like you, and to circle way back, like you said in the beginning, as long as there's a criteria for a list and you post that and you make it public knowledge, like, hey, we're putting a list together. This is how we're doing it. This is what's going to make it eligible. And now here we go. You should know full well going into it what to expect, especially where half wheel. I know you guys, your list is mostly based off of, and I know Coop does it this way too, and, and most people do. It, a lot of it has to do with the way the cigars were rated during the reviews during the year. So it's like Coop says all the time, not to keep referencing him, but, you know, he, he likes to throw his opinions out a lot, which is nice because I can use it. Um, but it's, it's hard to not figure it out based on if you go back and you look at the reviews from the year, you can kind of get you can kind of gauge where the list is going to go. And I feel like people go into this, they just like thinking it anything's going to be on there. And it's like, well, no, I mean, if you look at the top 25, you can kind of gauge how things are going to land out and people just like i said i think people get wrapped up in it okay. it's the hype um but i see people are now starting to uh roll in their their comments on this we have <laughs> that was <laughs> quick that was quick yeah that was quick <laughs> um yeah uh start? i'm like uh, well i, I didn't know if you're going to scroll up. i didn't know yeah. if you're going to scroll up so i'm like right. i don't want to start reading let's this one jay davis oh jay davis buddy. okay so jay davis blue smoke dallas People need uh, reaffirmation. It's ego. You feel better if your song is ranked high or your cigar or your wine. That being said, some reviews like those from Half Wheel are respected. 
And then uh, to piggy, uh, piggyback, his next comment was, if Charlie likes a cigar I haven't smoked, I'm more likely to try it. That's a good point. Um, you have a respected palate, Charlie. <laughs> I, well, I, I, I that, <laughs> that, think he knew that. That, <laughs> that tells me people trust Charlie's opinion when yeah. it comes to reviews, and I would say that it probably is the same for, for most at Half Wheel. Um, like, you know, we talked about before. So, all right, so go down some more. Um, I use ratings as a starting point on cigars to try that I may have never tried before, which, Jeff, that's, buddy Jeff. that's, yep. I mean, that, I feel like that should be the only answer, even though I know it's not, and I understand why it's not the only answer, but that should be the answer. You see the list and you go, oh, okay, these were like, you know, the, the this, this publication thought, okay, these were the best of the, you know, these are the 25 best of everything that came out this year. Um, so if you haven't had it, you should go try it. Um, and I feel like, like Charlie mentioned before, like, I think in the very beginning, that's kind of how it was. And now it's just evolved into, I don't give a shit about anything but number one. And that's just kind of where we are now. Um, it's all about number one. But just to piggy, and again, to piggyback, um, Gracie had said, well, you know, she wants a list that's so made of things again. that are readily available, right? So right. if people are using that list as a starting point, they want to be able to go in and grab it. So I can understand that perspective as well. The availability part of it is is... It's tough because Charlie made a very good point about it before, um, but I also understand the other side of it too. Some people look at the list and they see cigars on there that are very unobtainable and they get discouraged because they're like, well, how the hell am I supposed to get that? Like the like the number one and two cigar on Half Wheel's list. Those cigars are very difficult to come by for a majority of people. Um, so you see that on the list and you're like, oh, well, it sounds great, number one and number two, but like I'll never try it. Some people, I'll never try it because – my local shops don't get that in or they get it in and they they do special stuff with it and I'll never have a chance to try it. Um, but at the same time, like Charlie said, just because it's difficult to obtain doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve to be recognized on the list. Um, All right. So we have. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is we're not trying to to do a list of like 25 cigars you should go out and buy right now. Um, we're trying to to take, you know, we review a lot of cigars in a given year we're just trying to, to with a few qualifications you know focus really on new cigars trying to give you a, a comparison of after everyone on our team has smoked it here are the 25 best of what we reviewed this past year not the 25 best cigars of 2021 because we didn't smoke all of them or even a quarter of the new cigars that came out last year right and not the 25 best cigars that we smoked last year because only reviews are eligible and not the 25 best cigars we reviewed because, you know, if cigar came out in 2017, it's not eligible for our 2021 list. Just here are the reviews that we did. And if all of us smoked them and sort of ranked them based off of how we would score each individual cigar, here's the results. Um, and so you can understand the difference. I mean, our, our list is entirely this year was comprised of 91s and 92 ratings. Here's a way to you, for you to differentiate between the 90 the 17 or 18 or probably more than that the 20 cigars i got 91 and here's the way to differentiate between the 92s uh and, and you know obviously some of the 92s probably did not end up in the top five but um that's it if we we're trying to do the 25 cigars that you should go out and buy right now yeah the the, the my father wouldn't be in there the fuente for ben next wouldn't be in there the taiwa at 110 kappa Espal kappa especial wouldn't be in there uh that's that's the top three so um, I forget what number four was. And Charlie, you know, you make a good point that I want to stress um, regarding, I think, everyone in the media to the, you know, the consumers and the, the viewers of these uh, publications that we have. Um, you mentioned something that would be so small, but you guys didn't smoke every new cigar last year. Neither did we. Um, I don't think Coop did. I don't think any media. I don't think. No, I mean, in any given year. anybody you're... does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we track the number of new cigars better than anyone does and I, I we fair. miss a, a lot of them and i'm guessing that last year we probably got a list that was somewhere in the neighborhood of the 965 is where last year's list stands of new cigars just in 2021 not anything that came out in december of 2020 i'm guessing there's something in the neighborhood of like 1500 new cigars and we don't count cigars that are, uh, you know, Room 101 makes a special cigar for this one store. Those don't make it onto the release list that we keep track of. You know, if your local cigar shop has 
150 bundles of something you know made by AJ, really not making it onto our list either. So if you start counting all of those things, there's thousands, like three, four thousand new cigars that that entered the U.S. market last year. Um, FDA probably has a slightly different recollection of how many new cigars came out in 2021, but it, it's not possible. You'd have to smoke a, a new cigar every hour or something uh, and and be on meth. So um, <laughs> no one has. No one smoked 20 percent of the new cigars that came out last year. Um, but, you know, uh, we're just trying to make our best attempt. But I, I, I certainly appreciate when people read our list and when they comment. I guess that's a complaint. They don't have a place to comment on our list. But, um, you know, uh, the exercise is not trying to tell you what to go out and buy. Um, if you want to use it to help make your buying decisions, I, I think it's probably a pretty valuable tool. But um, that's that's not what we're doing. And we're never going to go around and say in 2020, the best cigar of the year, without question, unequivocally was the Taiwahi Karloff. It's not how this works. Um, and I guess guessing if you ask the four of us, if we thought the Karloff was the best cigar that we reviewed, probably not a unanimous agreement. Definitely not unanimous agreement this year. Um, and if you asked us, quite frankly, in December 1st to guess what the number one cigar of the year was, I don't think a single one of us would have thought about the My Father Humidor Deluxe, mainly because it had come out 10 months previous or something, and we'd kind of all forgotten about it. Yeah, well, um, the, the other part of that I wanted to say was, um, you know, in, in to all those points, I think some people just assume or maybe they don't they don't realize how many cigars came out. And, and thank you for sharing that information because uh, it kind of helps my point. But I don't think people realize how many cigars actually enter the U.S. market every year. And I think some people assume that when you do reviews or if, you, if you're part of the media, you've had every cigar that comes out because that's what we do, quote unquote. You try everything. And, you know, Charlie will tell you that even from Half Wheel, that's not even close to the case. Um, so when you see a list, like, yeah, it, it's not, that's that's not going to be covered. That's that's not 25 of all of those releases because it's impossible to, to do that. You just make a list based on what you did have um, and how it was ranked based on review. Uh, and I think that's a point that I don't think it needs to be made clear, but it, it's nice. It's one of those, like, nice to know versus need to know kind of things uh it's, it's nice to know that hey or just to share with with the viewers um you know we we don't try to and and certainly don't achieve to smoke every single new cigar it's just impossible so you can't also be thinking that when you look at these lists like wow out of everything that came out this year they didn't have this on the list like like you said maybe the guys didn't smoke it maybe you didn't review it that's why it didn't make the list and it wasn't because you didn't want to it there's a lot of cigars that came out last year. Um, it's easy to miss some. So uh, I just I wanted to stress that point just so that people kind of have it in their mind, too. Um, and uh, so are we going to uh, let, let's hit our news segment really quick because yes. I keep forgetting about that. And I'm not watching the time, which I should be doing. That's OK. Um, I'll let you lead into that. Really? You don't want this week? <laughs> I feel like I've been doing doing the lead in with McAuliffe. I mean, I'll do it. You. I'll do it. All right. All right. <sighs> Let me I down there. I was ready for Sorry. you to do it. You've been doing it. Um, <clears throat> our new segment is brought to you by McAuliffe Cigars. McAuliffe Cigars, become an ambassador today. If you head over to McAuliffeCigars.com, you can sign up to be an official ambassador. And while you're out, get your McAuliffe ambassador coin and be part of the club. Uh, and in our McAuliffe news segment, it's McAuliffe news. McAuliffe has introduced two new sizes to the Riata line. It is the Toro and the Corona Extra. McAuliffe Cigars adds a Toro and Corona Extra to its Riata blend. The Riata bears the same name as Al McAuliffe's successful restaurant in Fort Worth and Alpine, Texas. The name pays homage to the majestic Riata Ranch in the 1950s epic movie Giant, starring James Dean, Rock Hudson, and Elizabeth Taylor, based upon the famous novel by Edna Ferber. Um, it's a great cigar. I'm excited for these two new sizes. Uh, we have had, I'm trying to remember, was it the Churchill yes. as of recently? Yep. Uh, which is a great cigar. I am definitely more of a Toro smoker, so I was excited to see them add a Toro to this line. Um, the Corona Extra is also an interesting size. That's definitely one that I'm excited to try. Uh, actually, I think we got some in today. So those are resting right now. We'll probably tear into those this weekend. But um, yeah, it, it's nice. You know, McAuliffe, other than the McAuliffe A that came out, um, 
it was a pretty quiet year for them last year, I want to say. They they'd had the Magdalia Special Edition. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember if there was anything else that they really came out with that was new and different. And I feel like there's like one that I'm a, that's a, escaping my mind. But I feel like relatively it was a quiet year. So I feel like the, the gist that I'm getting, the vibe that I'm getting from McAuliffe, not just because of this, just um, conversations I've had, I think that they're going to have a, a pretty good year this year. I, I expect to see a lot more releases from them, to see them doing some new stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how this year plays out for them. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm hoping to see them at PCA because they weren't there last year, and it would be really cool to see those guys at a trade show. I don't know if that's been decided for them. Yeah, I don't think, so it's, I don't think I it has think been. It I don't think it has been. So um i don't i don't think it has been they were not at tpe but it would be exciting to see them at pca so hopefully they go but there has um last time i talked to them a few weeks ago there was no official decision on that and jeff says the toro sizes in the herencia were new i think oh yes that's right yep. see i knew i was forgetting something um tom chriswell jr from youtube uh he follows up with another question Similar to your consensus list, any interest in creating an annual list that summarizes all of the cigar ratings from consumers that are, quote, out there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just kind of threw that one out. I you, know. I, just <laughs> 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 I probably should have built it up a little you, better. <laughs> I feel like I kind of uh, dropped it on Charlie. <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea uh, what out there is supposed to mean in this context. Yeah, but, I was um, trying to figure that out too. Tom, I, explain. I honestly, I was kind of hoping you knew. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, no, I, the the part with the consensus I think is very important as sort of the curator of the nonsense is I got to figure out something about how to include Instagram accounts. Um, I, I think that, you know, I've always said the consensus is best looked at as a, a window in between cigar companies and the media that writes about them or, or covers them. Um, and certainly there are plenty of Instagram accounts who I have to imagine are interacting with more consumers and more eyeballs than most of the lists that are on the consensus. And um, I, I, you know, the way I describe the consensus to people is imagine if you had uh, somebody who had never smoked a cigar or never smoked a cigar in 2021 and they had just an abundance of time on their hands and they decided to spend it reading, watching, listening to all of these lists. And at the end of when they were finished and they hadn't um, perished, uh, you would ask them, what was the best cigar in 2021? And um, the consensus is supposed to function like that. And so, you know, some of these Instagram accounts, I feel like probably should be included because of their importance. So I just need to figure out sort of some guidelines and, you know, it, it's it's really easy when you say you got to have a YouTube channel or you got to have a, a blog or a magazine or a podcast. Um, it's a lot tougher when it's like, oh, this guy gets 41 likes on Facebook on average. Um, I, I don't know what to make of that. I can assure you that 41 people uh, is more people than have consumed some of the lists that were included on the consensus. But, um, you know, there, there's got to be some sort of threshold. Otherwise, uh, I, I mean, I, I obviously don't have time to pour through every single Instagram account that attempts to make a top list of 2021. I mean, I imagine there's thousands of them. Now, would you consider a separate list for influencers compared to the regular? No. Account? Okay. No, I mean, I, I think that the Coop developing palettes world is much more interested in like, not necessarily segregating the list out, but in saying like, oh, we should, the YouTubers should have special qualifications. I very much say, Absent the retailer and sort of the manufacturer, you know, Dave Garofalo, who obviously sponsors you guys, uh, his primary business is selling cigars through Two Guys Smoke Shop. He also obviously has United and, and he has the Cigar Authority and, and that whole, um, you know, media operation. But Dave Garofalo, uh, you know, I don't know if every single cigar on the Cigar Authority's list this year is something that he sells. I would venture to guess probably because Dave Garofalo sells uh, the bulk of the cigars that are, you know, sort of mentioned on lists like this. But he obviously has even if he's not actively trying to do it, he has some you know, inherent uh, interest in, in trying to promote some cigars over others. And so it's easier just to say to, you know, the Cigar Authorities list, JR Cigars list, et cetera. We're not going to put those on there because it seems like there's pretty obvious conflicts of interest. Uh, but beyond that, I'm all for inclusion, treating people equally. And, um, you know, if, if we were starting to weight things and being like, oh, well, the Instagrammer should have their own list or they should only count for half or the YouTuber should whatever – it's like if that's the case, then CA gets weighted 99% or 99 times what everyone else is combined worth, and 
and there's no point. Okay. Well said. Well said. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, kind of take a break from the reviews and all that other stuff, because uh, I, I, I know it kind of gets a little redundant after a while. Uh, there's something that's relatively uh, fresh right now in the minds of of people, uh, and I know I know you've talked about it a little bit before. Um, the story that came out from well, not really a story, but the announcement that came out of PCA last week in regards to the marketing. I know you know this topic. Um, how do you how how do you feel about that in terms of the message that the PCA sent out? We should also just fill in our listeners because I don't know if they are. <laughs> Sorry, as you get Sorry, into this, I, I know that's true. I, I let's, just I know we've talked about it. I know we've talked about it. It was I think it was our yeah it was our news segment last week with Pete. We kind of covered it with Pete last week. We got his opinions on it. Um, what I'm referring to is if you didn't if you haven't caught it yet, um, the PCA, the Premium Cigar Association, sent out a letter or memo, whatever you want to call it, um, last week, letting everyone know. Um, its stance and kind of s the the situation surrounding some of the marketing on some of the cigar products, uh, specifically some of the ones that could be argued for um, being a little bit too fun, a little bit too maybe you would accuse it as being focused towards kids. Um, there's definitely there's some cigar manufacturers, there's some cigar subscription services that have had some cigars that come out along these lines. Um, it's been somewhat of a topic of debate i would say more so on the media side than kind of with everybody else but um is in terms of you know is it something that should be stopped is it something that you know makes the industry look bad in the eyes of the fda is it really is it really just for fun um and in fact i know coop has talked about it you know how he he doesn't like when people say uh well we're just trying to have fun and it's like yeah you're trying to have fun but there's a there's a risk involved in that um you know does you know the FDA who's already coming after tobacco products you know in the cigar industry you know mm. they always the one of the biggest arguments oh kids getting kids on tobacco and people come out with certain marketing practices or whatever that it, it has nothing to do with kids it's not directed towards kids but one could pick it up and argue it that way um, so it's been a topic of debate um, and Charlie I was just interested to get your opinion on that story um, since it's been like I said somewhat popular lately uh yeah i mean I'll, I'll start with the pca's um letter whatever we're gonna call that yeah. um i i felt like uh, i mean you invite me on a podcast or whatever we're calling this and bound to probably say some mean things about the pca it seems like but um it happens it happens i, I felt like it was awful quite frankly in terms of the communication um it was tough to follow the part at the end where it was like this is not in response to any specific products or recent events and it's like uh okay why are you sending the letter then like um and, and also obviously not true like we can all think of, of specific products um and i, I also think this has been a, a years long not not a years long but a, a multi-year long failing of not just the PCA, but the CRA and the CA as well. Uh, there are very few people who work in the cigar business who have consumed as much information about FDA as I have. Um, and, and I don't mean to sound obnoxious, but I have spent ungodly amounts of time, um, you know, weeks of my life reading what the FDA has to say, listening to what the FDA has to say, reading reports about from, uh, you know, independent people who have degrees and, and specificities in FDA dealings um and it, it you don't have to spend the week that i spent if you spend a couple hours reading what the fda says about tobacco products on a pretty regular basis you will learn that there are two things that you really need to stay away from one of them is flavored tobacco or you know obviously it's still legal but fda has very clearly said it intends on going after that um but you know the fda very much uh cares a lot about flavored tobacco um, and the other thing is marketing to children or anything that could be construed as marketing to children. And that's important because I, I think in some of the cases in the cigar business, I don't think that these are attempts to try to get 14 year olds to buy cigars. That being said, they could be construed as attempts to have 14 year olds buy cigars or entice 14 year olds to buy cigars. And the cigar industry and the PCA certainly and the CRA and CA 
uh, you know, and, and I think most people in the cigar business have tried to argue to FDA that these are products that are expensive. They're not the Swisher Sweets. They're, they're too expensive for a 12 year old to purchase. They're not cigars that are used for blunts. Uh, and so a lot of the underage use cases that applies to machine made cigars are removed. And they're, you know, obviously some of them are flavored, but most of them are not. And that we don't market to children. The, the line is always, these are products that adults enjoy with a glass of scotch, you know, in a lounge or at their home after a dinner, it's a luxury item, blah, 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 blah. The PCA and their contemporaries, the CRA and CA, have done a terrible job, in my opinion, explaining, it, certainly publicly, maybe privately they've done jobs, a better job that I'm unaware of, but they have not explained the consequences and just how important this stuff is. This is something where it doesn't matter how many cigars they sold. You know, the example that gets like to throw about, around a lot is Pravada Cigar Club Sesame Street themed cigars, the Cookie Monster, the Big Bird cigar. I feel like there was one of those. They had other cigars, quite frankly, that were probably more egregious in my opinion. The, there was one that was a had an ice cream cone as a band and was like chocolate swirl or something. Those are things, it doesn't matter if they sold five of them. Um, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if they sold any of them. You put it on a website, you look like you're trying to sell it. FDA, if they find out about things like this, is going to lose their shit. And what it's going to mean going forward is that every time that the C PCA sits down in a meeting with FDA and says, hey, they give them the whole spiel. We don't market to children. These are expensive products, luxury items. People drink them after they or eat, smoke them after they eat a big meal and drink them with scotch. All that goes away because they're like, yeah, but what about the ice cream cone cigars? What about the Cookie Monster cigar? What about Dave Garofalo's uh, cigars that are packaged to look like Willy Wonka candy? What about cigars that come with a toy inside? And they're like, yeah, yeah, but those are those are just a small percentage, limited edition, and not what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. FDA is just going to keep going back to it. It's going to be like having an argument with a child. They're just going to never let that go. And it means that, in my opinion, every meeting that the PCA would have with FDA, I'm guessing that like three quarters of it would be spent just relitigating Cookie Monster and Dave Garofalo's chocolate bar cigars and whatever else the FDA looked at and said, this is this could be construed as marketing to children. And so I think what the PCA should have said is, look, this stuff can't happen. Just because it's illegal right now and just because you haven't gotten in trouble yet doesn't mean that there are no consequences. There will be consequences, whether it's today, tomorrow, a year from now. At some point, FDA is going to find out about one of these products. And once they do, it's going to cause us to have to spend so much time and energy just trying to get back to square one. And we may not even get there. FDA may just say, screw it. We don't believe what you guys have been telling us for years because we have examples of the exceptions to the rule. And so what I think PCA should have done is said, the stakes are high. This is not to be screwed around with. If you have any questions, if you think like, if you're, if you're like, I'm not sure if this is marketing to children, contact us, contact the CRA, contact the CAA, contact somebody that can tell you if you're even close to the gray area, because you need to stay as far away from the gray area as possible. You, you, you can't even get close to the line. And they need to go out and, and use some of the power they have. They need to say, look, we're not going to tolerate these products on the trade show floor. They did this similar thing with CBD and whatnot. And they just say, look, if we look at a product and we think it, it is close to an area of problematicness from marketing to children or whatever, we're going to not let you display it at the trade show floor because that's not what we're about. That's not what we think the cigar industry should be about. And, you know, we're all in favor of freedom of speech and everyone's right to run their business their own way. And, you know, as far as the, the PCA, which is a, a nonprofit, but still somewhat a business, like our rules are our rules. And uh, instead, they do what they oftentimes do and try not to offend anyone and then end up not really saying much and causing more controversy. But a lot of this problem is they just have not, and not just the PCA, this is everybody, this is all the people that deal with FDA, have not really explained the stakes. This is not the same as kicking the vapor people out of the trade show. This is not the same as the CBD cigars. This is a very, very different thing where there's a mountain of evidence that says FDA really, really cares about this. And the consequences, you know, when FDA finds out about some of these products, they're, they're gonna be insane. And they're not gonna be just limited to Pravada Cigar Club or Dave Garofalo or whoever else has products that FDA doesn't like. The entire industry is going to have to deal with the mess that's created from these products. And it doesn't help, you know, in some ways I guess it's helpful, but it, it, it's also frustrating in a lot of ways because these are generally pretty small, limited releases. Like they're not what pays Dave Garofalo's bills. They're not likely, I would imagine, you know, what makes a difference on Pravada's P&L. Um, and so 
it'd be one thing if you're talking about a core product that you sell hundreds of thousands of a year, but I, I don't, most of the time we see stuff that, that gets close to that line or crosses that line, in my opinion, it's always like 200 boxes, 200 bundles of 10. And it would just be immensely easier for everybody in this business to just not even do it, not come close to it and just say, you know, I wish we could be as create, you know, I wish we could be more creative, but there are lines and, and there are consequences. Do you think people do it because it's like a low hanging fruit, something easy and something like it's most random? No, I'm just I'm thinking about it too. Just and I'm just you know thinking about it with with the group. It's like why it, like Charlie's point. Like why even do it, right? It, is it just because it's so easy to do? Is it just because it's so easy to get people's attention with it? Like oh my god, look at that, and I have to buy it. Um, it, you know I I agree. I I think that and you make. A, a solid argument and as someone like you know like you said who has spent so much time absorbing in the fda everything that they've talked about the things that they argue with and those being the two big things the flavored tobacco is is its own discussion um i really won't get into that right now but that is a whole discussion on its own and that is a i think that's public enemy number one right now but this certainly will become public enemy number two and eventually you know number one rather i should say eventually um, it, it, it is, it is something that, you know, you're right. It, it, it can be used against them. Um, in a, in a, no, no, it, it will be used yeah. against the yeah. entire industry. Well, yeah, exactly. The, the two part test for like substantial equivalence, which is, I'm not going to get into it cause it would take 20 minutes to try to explain it. Yeah. But there's a very specific FDA process that most cigar companies, not all of them are going to have to start going through most likely at some point. The two part test is, does this product, you know, is this product substantially equivalent? And then the next two questions are. Does this product have a substantial, you know, does it pose an increased risk to public health? Not a substantial one, but an increased risk to public health. So is this product more dangerous than other approved tobacco products? And the second part is, does this product market to children? Those are the two things that FDA asks is part of the substantial equivalent process after the, is it substantially equivalent? Like, if you answer yes to either one of them is it more dangerous to public health than existing products it doesn't market to children the product gets rejected by fda that's how serious this is it's not like a the the when you guys weren't around for it or at least smoking tobacco wasn't but many years ago the pca back when it was called the ipcr decided to kick the vape companies out of the trade show they used to go to the trade show it wasn't it wasn't like tpe where two-thirds of the trade show was non-cigar companies or three-quarters of it, whatever it is a tpe but there was a, a contingent and I, I don't know who complained. Not very many people would be my guess. But at some point, the, the IPCBR's executive committee or the board, whoever, decided this was the issue they needed to go after. And they were like, you know, it makes it look a little cheap and flea markety. And then the other thing that they said is justification for why they were kicking these companies, going to ban these companies who were spending money at the trade show to be there. So revenue for the IPCBR. The other reason why they gave about removing them from the trade show was that they think that FDA cares about could misconstrue cigar products with the vape products and whatever. That to me was a whole bunch of nonsense. Now, I, I don't work for FDA. Maybe FDA did in fact care about it. It doesn't seem to jive with any of the things that I've read or seen from FDA. Marketing to children is definitely there. It's explicitly mentioned at just about every turn. And so this isn't a hypothetical scenario. This is a very real scenario. It's just a question of when and how many of these products does FDA discover. And I can assure you that if uh, if FDA saw some of these products and people applied for product approval, uh, there's no question in my mind that FDA would reject them for marketing to children concerns. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very easy to see that. And I think that, um, I think people get upset when they feel like they're being attacked because they make these products. And it's like, look, no one's coming after you specifically to just be just be hating on you for being you or whatever you're doing uh, as a whole. It's it's specifically about what you're doing with specific products and not even just because you're doing it, but how it could affect everyone else in the whole industry. Um, and I, so I, I think the, and I say that because a lot of, you know, the topic comes up, it always comes up and then people, they hear it, they hear a, a snippet of that and they just assume, oh, they're talking shit. And it's no, it's not people talking shit about you. It's trying to bring some solid concrete information um, to the forefront of, hey, like, I know this is fun. I know this is cool. And I know this is the vibe you're trying to do. And I get it. But at the same time, think about the bigger picture here. 
because there is the FDA, which looms over everybody, and they're going to use this against all of us. So especially you. Uh, and like Charlie said, if you, if you go to file substantial equivalence on that product, they're not going to approve that. So. And I think we all know that, you know, even with these cigars that are coming out, children probably aren't going to touch them. Yeah, I mean, the, we know the, that. We know that kids aren't going to gravitate towards them. I, you know, my argument I always go back to is, you know, pot is legal in Massachusetts. Is a child going to choose a cigar with a band or are they going to choose an actual chocolate bar <laughs> laced with pot? Like, it, like in front of them, right? But the fact of the matter is that it's not about – we know you're not marketing to kids by putting a cartoon on it. Hmm. Um, but the – it's the FDA. It's caring. The FDA, I feel like, cares more about that, the marketing. Yeah, whether children. whether or not you're <laughs> – and I think the, what it boils down to is whether yeah. or not you're actually trying to marketing to kids or not, which I – We all know you're we, not. We agree. We know or you're we not. Know. But the FDA is going to look at that and go, that's nice. Well – We think so. We think so because you're putting – Yeah. You're putting cartoons or, or food or treats or sugar and candy association with it. And who likes that most? Oh, I don't know. Uh, children. Well, everyone. But so, <laughs> but right. I know. But but mostly children. So it, it it's hard to argue against that, and they're not going to care. They're just going to look at that at, at on the surface and be like, well, that doesn't matter because this is how it is, and that looks like something that would be appealing to a child. So yeah, it looks like you're trying to market to children. Oh, but that's not what we're about. No. Well, then why did you do it? I mean, it, it, that's how it looks. It's it's black and white, really, uh, when it comes down to the FDA stance on it. Like, you know, and Charlie really laid it out fully, um, you know, which, which was nice. And, I, and thank you for that, Charlie. Um, but I, th really, I just wanted to touch on it. And I, and I knew you were coming on and this this came out and I thought it would be great to um, to have you explain it. And I know you are very involved with the FDA stuff, so I, I know that you would probably be, even be able to explain it better. I just want to circle back for a minute, though, to Charlie, which is. People aren't clear on what consequences are for this. I think that's a good point. What, just to explain, yeah. what are the consequences? What is the inevitable? And I know it, it, I want to say inevitable. Well, I can't talk. But um, what are potential consequences for this? I mean, on the, the highest of levels, the cigar industry's argument consistently has been these are handmade products that are expensive, that are sort of out of the reach of kids. You know, you don't see 12 year olds in cigar shops where these products are sold. They're not sold at gas stations and convenience stores for the most part. And these are products that kids have no interest in. And if the FDA sees products that it looks like things that kids would have interest in, then it, it destroys the whole thesis. Um, and that will cause, you know, perpetual problems. Um, because, as I mentioned, it's going to be like arguing with a kid. FDA is just going to keep going back to, yeah, yeah, but that one time we saw a Cookie Monster cigar. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, it was one time. We told them not to do it again. They promised they're never going to do it again. Can we please talk about some of the other issues? And they're going to be like, well, yeah, but you're telling us you don't market to children. And we have evidence that, you know, as far as we're concerned, is pretty clear evidence that you had products that looked like they might be of interest to a child. And I, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to be the fun police here. Like, I love creative cigar packaging. I wish that we could have cigars that looked like Sesame Street characters and there were no consequences to them. Um, but that's that's not the case. And I, I think that a big part of the failing here has been, this just has not been effectively communicated to cigar manufacturers and cigar retailers. Cigar retailers should look at these products and go, we don't wanna be associated with them because we understand that this is a threat to our business um, and, and an existential threat at that. That if products like this are a regular thing, or even if they're not, even if they're an irregular thing that FDA is aware of, that it will increase the the restrictions that retailers, even retailers that don't sell these products, are going to be subject to. It's not like FDA is going to come out and say, "Hey, look, I got a set of rules for shops that have not sold Cookie Monster cigars, and here's a set of rules for shops that have sold Cookie Monster cigars." That's not what FDA is going to do. They're just going to say, "Here's the set of rules. Everyone's got to follow them." And it's the same thing on the manufacturing side. And, and, you know, some of it honestly could extend to media outlets like you and I. Um, and so it's just better to stay very, very far away from it. It's kind of like drinking and driving, right? Like, you know, one drink, you drive home, whatever. It, it's just a much better policy to just not drink and drive in any capacity. It, yeah. And just never have that be a question. Um, and, you know, 
I think if it was explained to maybe uh, the example of drinking and driving the cigar industry maybe doesn't work as well. But I think if it was explained to a level of seriousness that that it actually is, it would be helpful. One of the other problems I'll add here is that some of the messaging you know from 10 years ago is really tough because a lot of the organizations were kept telling people, you know, the threat's coming, the threat's coming, the threat's coming. And, you know, we're six months away, we're six months away, and it never came. And so I think a lot of people in the industry kind of lost faith in what was being said by some of these trade organizations about how real these threats are. As someone that's been skeptical of a lot of the stuff that comes out of these trade organizations' mouths, I can assure you this is not a, a hypothetical, inconsequential issue. This is a, a massively consequential issue, and that's why I wish the PCA would have taken a much stricter and much stronger, we're not going to tolerate it. And neither should our retail members and neither should our exhibitors. And, and we're going to, in the, the places that we actually have the power, which is we control what you're allowed to do on the trade show floor, you know, we're judge and jury and we're just not going to, not going to tolerate it. And once again, they, they did that with CBD products. I, I think they can, you know, the rules of the trade show are they can do whatever they want. So I, I wish that they would have gone a step further. Yeah, I mean, it it, it will be interesting um, to see how it continues to play out. I mean, because it will. There's no doubt about it. It's not like it's just going to stop and go away. You know, both on do people stop making these products before it's too late? You know, does, does doomsday come? Um, does the PCA finally just, you know, like you said, you know, did they finally just put their foot down and be like, you know what, all right, we're done. Like, this is it. We're out. Yeah, and, w and when I talk about consequences, what like is that plain packaging in the future? I mean, I guess is it ban I, on like again, like how bad can it get? Yeah, I do, guess. You, do you think plain packaging is is you know is I mean, is brought up as something that is a? Do you think that this marketing with some with some of these products would be a major catalyst to push the FDA towards, all right, well, then you know what? You have to go plain packaging on all your stuff, and you can't you can't do anything. Um, I, I think plain packaging is definitely on the roadmap. FDA has lost some lawsuits in the, the cigarette world that are going to make it much more challenging for them to get a, uh, to enact plain packaging. Um, but, um, you know, there's no question that, that at some point, you know, unless I die in the very near future, at some point in my lifetime, I'm going to see the cigar industry have to fight plain packaging in the U.S., yeah, I mean, it is something that is out there. It's looming. Canada's doing it. Uh, there's And it's not fun, guys. Go Google that. Google what that looks like if you don't New know what it looks like. Is it Australia or New Zealand, I think, is doing it, too? I think it's Australia. I don't know. I Charlie, I don't know if, if you know. Is it is it, is Australia doing it, too? Um, Australia's got plain packaging. Uh, Ireland has got plain packaging. The Netherlands has a restriction on some forms of packaging. Um, so uh, the Netherlands has one of these really unique situations. I believe it's the Netherlands. I may be confusing my European countries here, but I believe it's the Netherlands, but I might be off here. But there's a place where one of the Habanos distributors actually has to repackage the cigars because of uh, metallic packaging is uh, banned in that particular country. So like Tubos and um, any band that has any kind of well, like Cohiba doesn't have the holographic. No, oh, yeah. like, like, no, no, like this band. So this band has, like, a metallic gold on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So even that, like, they don't want that. They want it just like plain paper. Yeah. That's yeah. No. Interesting. You want to sell your, uh, your Sancho Panzas? Perfectly okay, but uh, not so much this stuff. Any kind of foil, metallic on the band. Yeah, foil oh. would be the best way to describe it. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Uh, wow, that's interesting. I didn't even know. That, that is really unique. Well, I saw that happen. So when I did live in England, it was the time where they changed all their smoking rules. So when I had lived there, it was actually 16 to smoke cigarettes there. And then they had bumped it up. And in that time, they enacted the packaging on cigarettes that had, like, the mutilated lungs and, like, to deter. Yeah, the graphical warning labels. Yeah. yeah. They're not fun to see, guys. Just saying. Yeah, no. So FDA <laughs> lost a lawsuit uh, regarding that on cigarettes, uh, but is actively trying to uh, attempt to do that again. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we bring this up on the show a lot because uh, anything that's related to, like, FDA and the legislative stuff, because, you know, it's not something that does get talked about everywhere, and it's not something that is, I feel like a lot of consumers, they don't realize that it does exist and just how much it not only how much does it exist but 
how severe the consequences could be, um, you know, especially if it goes unchecked. And that's where these organizations, these trade organizations, they really come into play because they are, you know, the first and foremost people to, to stand up and, and try to push back on it. So, um, that, you know, and that's why I like to bring it up so people are aware because it, it is important. And if we just ignore it, then, you know, that, that doesn't help anybody anyway. So, um, but Charlie, thank you for, thank you for explaining your side on that and with the FDA and your experience with that. I thought that was really valuable to, I think a lot of people will find that very helpful. Um, I definitely learned a couple of things from you on that that I, I didn't know, and, and I try to I try to keep on as much as I can. But I mean, obviously, I don't I don't spend the, the time on it that you do. So thank you for that. Um, we'll go a little bit lighter as we end out the show. Give you a little bit of a, a break from the the hardcore stuff. We'll go to our top three segment, and we'll close it out. Uh, our top three segment is brought to you by Room One Hundred One. And um, are we sticking with uh, are we sticking with the other ad read that we talked about last week? Yeah, I like that one. I mean, it's it's room 101, so I mean. We, you know what? Next week we need to load the video up. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Throw the video on too. We do. We do. Uh, as Matt Booth would put it, room 101. It fucks. Um, oh wait, no, uh, that wasn't the one I was going for. Oh, which one were you going for? Watch smoke and tobacco. Eat your vegetables. Oh, and that's smoke room right. 101. I forgot about that. I thought we were <laughs> going said last week. Yeah, no. Um, direct, quote, direct quote from him. <laughs> watch the smoke and tobacco show. Eat your vegetables. Take your vitamins. And smoke room 101. Yeah, that's that's what it'll be. <laughs> that's what it'll be. That's what it'll be. Yeah. Um, so not necessarily a top three. I'll just make it a general three for you, Charlie. Um, what are three things that you know everyone knows you as is Charlie Minato, Half Wheel, cigars, yada yada yada. But what are three things outside of the cigar industry that uh, that you actually enjoy other than cigars? Do you have other interests uh, that <laughs> makes you tick? I know. <laughs> I know. Like I know of a few, but. Um, I will, I will let you have your, your space to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of them, I guess we talked about ahead of time or before the show went live and I have a prop, so we'll use the prop. So I have taken up an interest in collecting these Rosenthal espresso cups, um, and spend way too much time and money acquiring them. Um, that's a pretty weird one. Um, I would say that uh, another thing that uh, I would imagine most people are unaware, I spend uh, an inordinate amount of time listening to college football podcasts and consuming college football media. Even like like before we got on, I was listening to a recruiting podcast. I, I don't entirely know why. I, I find it as nice background noise. I certainly like watching college football um, and, and find the sport to be interesting. But, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a weird one. Um, as far as like a third thing that interests me... Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, certainly food is, is something that, um, you know, going to restaurants and, and, and trying new things and, and seeing, you know, different types of cuisines um, is something that, you know, like if I have to travel, that's a, certainly a bucket list or not a bucket list, but that's a priority when traveling is like, let's let's go out and, you know, eat at, you know, some of the, the better restaurants in whatever city I'm in. So um, I would say those are, are three things. Obviously, a couple of them more peculiar than the other one. Are you uh, – Wait, now I have a follow-up question first. So because um, you, you're you um, in Texas, so best restaurant where you live. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm very fortunate to, to be good friends with the staff at Taon, which is a Japanese restaurant here in Dallas that's uh, considered to be one of the better Japanese restaurants in the U.S. and, and maybe even outside of Japan. Um, and it's certainly, you know, for the since it's been open, um, is pretty consistently ranked by the local media here as is either the best restaurant or the, the next best restaurant in the city, depending on the year. So um, that would be our recommendation. But you know, Dallas's uh, food scene is uh, evolving, um, and uh, it, it certainly has gotten a lot more interesting over the last five years. And have you ever been to Boston? Uh, yeah, so I was actually born in Beverly, Massachusetts. So. Oh. Okay, oh, so actually, I, I did started know my that. life. I did know that. I don't know if I heard you say that or if I read it somewhere, but I did know that yeah. actually. Yeah. In our neck of the woods. And I, I remember. Re I remember like, oh no way. <laughs> I was just gonna ask though if you had a favorite place in Boston. Um, I have not spent very much time in Boston, so I was there for the first three years of my life, and then my parents moved. Um, but uh, the last time I was there, uh, is it Neptune Oyster? Is yep. that uh, yeah. the name of the restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. 
that's probably my favorite uh, meal in Boston. I spent I've spent more time in the last decade in the Cape than I have in Boston. Um, but uh, I definitely enjoyed Neptune Oyster, um, even if it took hours to to get in. Fair enough. I'd are, ask. are you so I I know you like food, but are you like one of those hardcore like Yelp critics too? I mean, because you have that knack because I mean, you review cigars and whatnot. <laughs> And I know you like food, so is that kind of like your secret guilty pleasure? You get to review food no. too on the download. <laughs> no, uh, so actually, to, to sort of the point we were talking about earlier, um, I, I will never review food because I, I learn with cigars. If you, if you want to suck the enjoyment out of something that you you like, you just just make it your job. Um, there is that that slogan that everyone likes to quote. You know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And there are certainly parts of that. I'm very thankful to have the the job that I have and that it pays the bills. But uh, there are also some some days when I don't want to smoke cigars um, or I don't want to talk about cigars. And uh, when it's your job, uh, you don't have much of a say in that, um, even if you're in my position. So uh, I have no desire to start reviewing restaurants. I'm very much the person that goes in and wants to just enjoy my time. Um, be a customer and uh, and enjoy what's being served, um, and uh, I have no desire to be a, a Michelin inspector, let alone a, a Yelp <laughs> troll. All right, that's funny. Um, yeah, wh- one last question I had for you related to this topic did did I hear right that you're also into auto racing? Mm-hmm. What forms of auto racing are you do you follow? So uh, most of them. Um, Le Mans is my favorite sporting event in the world. Um, the 24 hour Le Mans, which for, I would venture to guess 99% of the people, uh, listening, uh, every year in France or almost every year, depending on wars and other things, uh, there's a 24 hour car race, uh, in a city called Le Mans. And, uh, there are different classes of cars. So you'll see things like Porsche 911s that are started their lives out relatively similar to a Porsche 911 that you could buy in a store and look relatively similar to a Porsche 911, um, all the way up to the prototypes, which are cars that that are not ever going to be road legal and don't have road legal technology. Um, that's my favorite race. It, it's it's a whole event. Typically, I will uh, get a whole bunch of Chinese to try to stay up as late and as long as I can and, and watch as man, much of the, the 24 as, as I can. Um, but uh, I my pandemic or, or one of the pandemic things I took up, my sister was back in Dallas. Uh, she was finishing up at the University of Alabama, but she was sent home uh, during COVID. And uh, I would meet up with her and my mother on Sundays. And there was very few sporting events happening at the time. And so we would unsober ourselves and watch NASCAR. And that has turned into a just full on uh, like appreciation of NASCAR and all of its quirks and uh, intricacies. Um, I but know uh, where I also you're gonna go. Sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, but yeah, I also watched most of the Formula One races. Certainly, last season was great because uh, it was close from start to finish, um, literally to, to finish. Uh, but uh, typically, in the years when Hamilton or Vettel was dominating, I'd watch the first two thirds of the season, and then when when it became very clear what the outcome was going to be, I'd, I'd lose interest. But uh, yeah, so a little bit of IndyCar here and there, or, uh, drag racing maybe in the background every once in a while, um, but mainly uh, NASCAR, Formula One, a uh, little bit of sports car racing. So the only thing I'm not really, like, rally, I, I don't really have any interest in that. Yeah, me either. Um, oh, it's funny. I didn't know that you actually follow NASCAR pretty well. Um, I, I follow NASCAR. I'm a huge NASCAR fan. Every Sunday it's on. Um I grew up in a family that was a huge NASCAR family, um, although I didn't really get fully into it, like for myself, until I was an adult a few years ago. Um, that's when I like really honed in on it. But growing up, it was always around, so I knew enough. I knew, you know, my family was an Earnhardt family, and then when senior, and when he died, then they then they went over and they were they were Gordon fans and they were Tony Stewart fans. Um, my favorite driver in NASCAR is Kyle Busch. Um, I don't know who, who you follow, but I know Kyle is a very um, – you either love him or you hate him. But that, that, that is my number one. And then uh, it's usually most guys at, at Joe Gibbs after that, and then it's Kurt Busch, and then it's uh, pretty much anybody except Team Penske. I don't, I don't like the Penske guys at all. 
but I'm not sure. I'm not yeah, sure uh, you lie. <laughs> um, I, I certainly could understand that. I'm, uh, my sister and I decided we were going to like pick a driver in the midst of our lack of sobriety. Um, and, uh, I know someone who, uh, I guess they, they were a contractor who worked for a cigar company at one time or another, um, who went to go work for, I don't think she worked for NASCAR. I think she worked for Speedway Motorsports, but she, uh, she was certainly heavily involved in NASCAR for a few years. And I was like, Hey, who's the nicest driver? Like, who's the one that like, just seems like a nice person. And so she was like Martin Truex. So yeah. we adopted Truex. Um, big fan of his wife's Twitter account when shit's hitting the fan. Um, and, or, or I, they're not married, his partner's Twitter account. Um, and uh, my sister is the proud owner of the right side quarter panel from the Bristol Dirt Race. It was her birthday gift from you last year. Oh, wow. That's crazy. From the Dirt Race. Which has dirt on it which is kind of crazy yeah race used obviously so yeah <laughs> uh that that's cool um yeah martin truex is i like him he's i like i said most guys that joe gibbs i like i like denny i i never liked denny uh in the beginning but then i learned like you know what denny's not that bad of a guy and he's a gibbs driver so why am i hating on him because i don't like the penske guys even more uh like logano and uh, well, actually, Denny seems like he should drive Sir Penske though. Like he he has that personality. He's a bit of an asshole. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I could see that. But I, I try to I try to stick to the team. So um, also Brad Kozlowski, who actually drives for Roush Fenway now. Um, Roush like, Fenway Kozlowski. Yeah, yeah. Roush, and I forgot about that. Yes, yeah, Roush Fenway RFK. Kozlowski. Yeah, yeah. R RFK. Uh, I don't like him at all. Um, so <laughs> I don't like him at all. I'm not shy about it. I don't like, I don't like him at all. I think he's an ass, but, um, everyone's going to say some other drivers an ass, but I, I think he's an ass. Um, I don't like him at all. So that, that did you was, enjoy the clash at all? Uh, I caught some of the clash and I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was very good and it seemed like it was very successful. And I think NASCAR is definitely in a period of trying to get its fans back <laughs> for the most part. I think. I think it went well with people. I thought it was interesting, very fast paced. The only thing with that is, and I was actually talking to Carney about this, because um, Carney caught the whole thing and he had talked to me about it. And he was like, the one thing about the clash that I thought was, if you didn't roll off in the top four, you never had a chance to win that race. It was just too tight. Yeah, it, it was. I wasn't a huge fan of it from a. It just gave me flashbacks. We went to the uh, in person to the All Star Race uh, in Texas last year, mm. which is even more nonsense than the Clash was. But it was just like, man, this is so dumb. Like, I, I get that you can't put thirty cars on this track, but like, this is just stupid. But uh, it's you know, it's an exhibition event. It is what it is. I'm not really a big short track guy to begin with, so already, I'm not. A, I wasn't excited because I don't like the short tracks. I like the um, I really I like, like the short tracks. I I mean, I'm, I a, I'm a super speedway guy because I like the speed and I, I like the action and I like the big one. You never know when it's going to come or who it's going to grab. And it's always fun to find out if your driver is going to escape that mess or not. Um, for me, I think it's more that, that excitement of the, the high speed crashes. Not that I want to see anyone get hurt, but it's that it's kind of like that old school, like they they banged around a lot more back in the day. They don't do that so much anymore. So that, that high velocity action, I think is what gets it for me. So, I mean, I, I watch short track racing. It, it's part of the, it's part of the season and, and I'll, I'll enjoy it, so to speak, but I would say it's probably it's like going to be a bigger favorite. part of the season. Yeah. I think it is going to be a bigger part of the season. Um, also to be interesting to see how uh, the next gen car plays out this season. I know that there's already been some concerns with it. Uh, especially there's a, there's a shortage on the, on the supply chain. Um, I don't know if you saw the news, but Daytona, they, they said that the winner of the Daytona 500 actually won't have their car on display this year because of the supply chain shortages. No, no, it's on display for breakfast the next day, and they get to take it back. Oh, I didn't know that part. All right, so they get it for breakfast, yeah. but then they get to take it back. <laughs> no, it's a complete mess. Um, no, I mean, I'm curious about it. I, I think it's – it also, like, I'm – I was fascinated to see that, uh, like Floyd Mayweather and a couple of the non-chartered people were attempting the. It's like, where did those chassis come from? If there's a chassis shortage, but um, yeah, no, I'm curious. I mean, I think that the the last generation of car got a bit stale, but also, 
you know, so much of this is just dependent on what, if anyone's still watching this at this point, God bless you. But, um, you know, it's also dependent on what NASCAR does. I mean, I, I think that, you know, some of these tracks, uh, Texas is, is almost unbearable to watch. Um, it's just, the, it, maybe the next gen car will fix this, but it just, it's unbelievably boring. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm curious to see if they screwed up Atlanta. Um, and I'm certainly, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many of these, uh, you know, sort of historical or maybe not historical, but some of these interesting short track venues that NASCAR maybe has an interest in going to, whether that's uh, Nashville Fairgrounds um, or certainly Rockingham, um, to see if uh, if some of those actually come back onto the Cup Series schedule. Yeah, uh, it, it'll be exciting for sure. Uh, we are running out of time, though, as much as I'd love to keep going with you on this because uh, i did not know that you followed nascar this is really fun to know now full bore um <laughs> so uh we are running out of time but charlie thank you for being here with us tonight i really appreciate it i really appreciate you taking the time um it, it, it was great to have you here and to, and to have your insight you know especially with the fda stuff um i didn't realize just how far you know you really followed it and you were in depth with it so it was really nice to get your 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 side on things and, and your point of view um so thank you really for being here thank you for having me absolutely anytime anytime you're welcome back uh guys watching and listening at home thank you for listening thank you for watching with us thank you for being here with us don't forget to i was gonna say before you wrap up um next week we have juan lopez from gurka oh that's on right the show. yes we have juan lopez Good from Gurkha. and um uh, the week after that is The Great Smoke, and we have a special episode, so we will not be doing a show on Thursday night, but we will be doing one on Friday night from one of those Smoke In locations live with a special guest. That's a true. Mystery guest. Mystery guest. We're going to call it a mystery well, guest. Well, it might be multiple mystery guests. It could be. I'll, I'll throw that in. That makes <laughs> it more interesting. There might be multiple mystery guests from down in uh, Boynton Beach, West Palm Beach, wherever we decide to go that night. Um, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Don't forget to like and subscribe, as always, and visit smokingtobacco.com for more news, information, and content. Uh, and that's going to do it for this week. Yeah. So, guys, thank you very much. We'll see you next week with Juan Lopez.